What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Tell Mom. I'm Colin, and this is Brittany. And we are the uh, brother-sister duo that talk about whatever the hell we want. <laughs> Check out this setup right here. And if you notice, we have something new on the setup. Phyllis! Phyllis! Hey! Phyllis is here to join us, and um, we are going to be kind of talking about addiction and recovery and uh, kind of feed off of the last few episodes that we've talked about. And um, I've heard through you and her just now while we were setting up that she's got an amazing story. Yes, yes. We're so excited to have you on, Phyllis. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. And uh, and yes, I know Phyllis' story, but none of you do. And one of the big things in recovery and with AA and NA and things like that is that the reason why it's so successful, I think, is because you are getting help from your peers. You're getting help from people that have been through that before, Mm -hmm. have gone down through there, you know, yeah. and so that's why I think that it works, and um, I just wanted you to share your story with our audience, because it's an amazing one, and we have so many people that have uh, reached out, oh my gosh, comments. the comments yes, and the emails, us. we've been getting personal emails too, on, on, on yeah. the personal channel and stuff, just about their stories and T- stuff, it's telling like, their stories, yeah, and I think that it's therapeutic for y'all to tell us your stories, and as we're sitting here telling you ours, and then... We thought, what better than get somebody else on to tell theirs, you know, and, and just help each other is the goal, right? So, yeah, we're excited to have you on. Yeah. I'm very excited. So, you're from around here originally? Uh, I mean, uh, kind of, sort of, I guess, in the same area. Uh, how, nah, how North Alabama. Is, North Alabama. You're yeah. from Alabama, though. I am. Alabama. I am. You can't Muscle hide that accent. Muscle Shoals, you got some good music. Yeah. 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 Yeah, hit recording capital of the world. So. That's oh, right. yeah. Yeah, that's their, their name little, to fame. Of yeah. <laughs> little motto. Okay, so tell us, uh, Phyllis, tell us your story. I want to hear it. Um, and you just tell us however little or, or uh, however much or little that you want, okay? Okay, well, um, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. That's right. Um, I grew up in a... Um, very dysfunctional home. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we can all relate. So, <laughs> uh, so um, by doing that, um, there was some trauma that happened to me as a child. Um, my brother getting killed in our living room when he was four. Oh my so it changed my whole family from a normal family to a very dysfunctional using family. They became alcoholics and addicts. That's just what happened. Mm. And um, growing up and then I left home at 14, came back. And left again. Um, To me, the streets were safer. So um, that's what I did. And That's uh, That's an interesting comment. To me, the streets were safer. That's that's deep. Keep going. Sorry. (laughs) So so, um, anyway, so I, you know, I was in my addiction. I started using it at a very young age. My father, he sold speed. And uh, it was in our freezer, so it was normal. Mm. And I thought it was the norm. And, um... Started smoking weed at the age of 12 and uh, smoked it up until uh, I had a little vacation. So, uh, <laughs> but um, I went through life like that. You know, I, um, and as I got older, um, I used more, you know, um, was going from city to city, town to town, state to state, trying to find me, you know, where I belong. But I felt like I never fit in, you know, and my, my addiction was getting worse. It was getting heavier. Um, this went on for a while, and um, I moved to Nashville and stayed up there. I was in an all-girl band. Um, we we said we were going to be stars, you know. <laughs> we, we was going to make it in Nashville. From Muscle Shoals yeah, to Nashville. Well, <laughs> we couldn't stay clean long enough to make anything. We couldn't even remember when our next gig was. So, oh, so everybody's staying high, you know, so that's what we did. Damn. And um, it, it got worse, and I ended up leaving there. And I end up going to um, Houston, Texas by myself with $50 in my pocket and a new car off the showroom floor. Now, was this to to get out of the addiction or try to start a new life? No, this or? was, I'm, I'm, I'm still running. Okay. You know, I I, you. and I, I don't you. know what I'm running from you at this know. point because, okay. see, at this point, I don't know I have a problem. I got you. Oh, I don't, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't have a problem. I party on the weekends. I just like to party. That's all I do. Yes, okay? Yes, I do not have a problem. Party girl. Right. Yeah. So they keep sending me to retreats and, and, and programs and stuff, trying to get me clean, but I don't have a problem. I don't understand. So, Right. Right. Mm. Well, 
Evidently. So you go to Houston for $50. <laughs> so I go into Houston, and I end up staying up there almost nine years. But what I did is um, I dumped men, and I picked up women. So now I'm not going to, because of what happened to me as a child, I don't feel safe there. So I'm going to stay in another type of environment. Okay. And uh, that's what I did. Okay. Um, years later, I had my son. And me and Emma were living together and um, not far from her mother in Burningwood Subdivision, right outside of Houston in Spring, Texas. So we, you know, this went on, but th me and Emma became very domestic. Okay. fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this was the norm. You know, you fought. That's what you did. You know, I grew up fighting. You always yeah. fight. That's normal. And if you got bored, you went to a bar and picked a fight. So it just, yeah. you know, it just is what it is. Did y'all meet through the drug? Or, like, was did she know you were doing the drugs? Or did she, did you know, I mean, did, was she no, part we of met, it? No, like? we met at Twins at a gay bar. Okay, so... She was the bouncer, and I was the bartender. <laughs> so I started doing shows okay. that making extra money. Mm -hmm. it was, we were in a group called Pizzazz. Okay. And so that's what we did. We, we did shows at different bars. So um, this one, this rocked on. I ended up having a, a son. Okay. And then things got worse. Um, I was really trying to stay straight then and do the right thing. But, you know, if you're living with an addict, you know, you function like one, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. That's so I end up calling my mom and them telling them, hey, come get me. I can't do this anymore. I need to make a, a new start. So I want to go back home and start over. Okay. So they come so down. Do you feel like at that time you, you hit rock bottom and that's when you called your mom? And well, I don't actually think I hit rock bottom. I just think that I wanted to get away from this woman. <laughs> 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 and I don't know how to do it. So if I go back to Alabama and she's in here in Houston, hey, there it is. Yeah. It's right there. There's my out. So yeah, okay. Okay. that's what happened. Okay. So I moved back. Um, and in, in all reality, I, I gave her false intentions that we were still going to be together. Mm -hmm. But I knew in my heart and mind that we were not. Right. You know, so I moved back and decided that's not the lifestyle I wanted to lead. It was just something I did out of the pain that I was in at the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm dumping women and I'm going back to men, okay? <laughs> so now, now things are going to get better. I'll tell you what, women are kind of crazy. So she didn't the right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, worse, I mean, never satisfied, always complaining. I'm like, really? No wonder he don't like you. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, that's what I did. I moved back home, and I started in school. I was enrolling in school. I had, we sold the house up there, and I bought me a place in Muscle Shows. Um, Good for you. Being by myself and hanging out with my cousins and everybody around their old friends that I knew, my addiction progressed rapidly. Oh, man. Okay, so I went from just smoking weed and drinking, which is all I ever done, to, to taking pills, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, staying really high. And I didn't even do speed and cocaine, but I would on occasions if everybody else was doing it, you know, that's just what you do. Right, right. right. Yeah. Like turn it down if it's free, right? right? That kind of well, thing. and were you a functioning right. addict? Yes, I worked. You, so you would yes, get I worked. I, I had, you know, I made sure I had a nice place, made sure, you know, I saw okay. the same gear. But I was still an addict. I mm -hmm. still had the behavior. Right. You know, um, uh, cannot complete stuff. Can't hold relationships. Um, I mean, I could never be happy because I was so broken inside. You right, know, right, right. You know, the stuff that happened to me as a child and the stuff that I seen as a child, I was so broken that I, I didn't know I was broken, but I knew something was wrong because I, was, I didn't want to make commitments. I didn't want to be responsible. I didn't want to be in a relationship because you have to make a commitment. I'm not good at that, and I don't do that well. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. Well, anyway, I end up meeting, um, I thought was the love of my life, which was Bill. And uh, we rode Harleys. Oh, yes. yes. Um, oh, Bill. Yeah. Oh, Bill. Bill. Kill Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I tried to do. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, he didn't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, saw my Miranda Lambert. I'm going home, load my shotgun, stand by the door and smoke a cigarette. <laughs> well, that's what I did. Okay. So, our, we're both addicts. Okay. We drink every weekend. We ride to all the functions. We party and we stay high. Okay. That's just the way it was. Okay. Okay, but I'm still functioning. I'm working. Hey, yeah. I'm working. 
You, you know, don't have so a problem. right because I don't have a problem. Right. I right. just party on the weekends. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. Okay. Really. I mean, y'all are the one with the problems because you're mad about it. Right. So yeah. whatever. So anyway, so I go on and um, we end up getting into a um, well. Bill just beat the shit out of me. I'm just gonna keep it real with okay. you. He liked. To, I fought him as long as I could, but uh, damn, that was hard. Okay. I mean, he's six foot one, two hundred and ten pounds, you know. But I wasn't going out without a fight. Yeah. So not. yeah. Phyllis is, is tiny, by the way. Yeah. Y'all can't tell. <laughs> 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 he was swinging. I can see uh, it. So, oh man. That's yeah, it was bad sad. because yeah. it, I was in such bad shape. It was like you know my eye was swollen shut. I had three ribs broke. My wrist was broke. Oh, my lip was busted. My nose was broken two places. And um, all I could think about was let me get to the kitchen to get this knife because I'm gonna kill you. Yeah. You know, and that's what was going on in my mind. Or where's the pistol? Yeah, you know, well, I open it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I'm trying to. I'm. Tra it's me or you, so I'm wanting it to be you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to function like that. Jeez. And he actually told me that he, um, after this was all over, and he moved out. Uh, he had a little help from his parole officer because I called him and asked him if he'd please move him so he don't go back to prison. Mm -hmm. So and he did. Mm -hmm. um, after that, um, now this. Well, let me ask you. This is all kind of. And do you, do you know now or did you feel then that this is all uh, associated with the lifestyle of getting high and drinking? And did you ever for a second stop and say, you know, maybe it's the company I'm keeping, which is addicts right. also. You know, was, did you ever no. blame the drug? Absolutely the not. No, this was else. normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is what my family did. did. Right. Yeah, right. this is what my family did. This is what my friends did. This is what I do. This is normal. Right. Until one day after after that after the big fight and, and everything and I was in school and I looked so bad they wouldn't even let me back in school they I had to wait to the next semester and start over which I did and I did graduate mm -hmm. but um I you. learned at yeah. that point that something was wrong and I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was but something was wrong in here and I can't live like this you know I mean I'm just not gonna live like this you know because I had in my mind that I'll never be hurt again I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me because, mm -hmm. see, my wall's up. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hurt you first so that so that I don't get hurt, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm getting chills. Look at that. I got chicken skin. I'm, I'm like, holding my arm up. I'm holding my arm up to the mic. Yeah. Like Y'all can see that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, anyway, so. that's protection. You know, yeah. that's our protection. Oof, and natural. so you wonder why you can't have a relationship. Well, you don't have anything to give. Mm -hmm. If you don't love yourself, then I can't love you. So what am I going to give you mm -hmm. if I'm that broken? Right. You know, so it rocked on, and um, I ended up leaving him. Mm -hmm. And shortly after, I'm working at Fox Distributors, and I meet my husband, Max. Mm -hmm. um, Max and I, he, he was going through a divorce. I was going through a divorce, and we kind of clung to each other. Um, Max was a good man. Um, he was. Um, I just don't think I was a real good person <laughs> because um, mm -hmm. I, I could – I could commit for a while, but then I didn't want to do it anymore, mm -hmm. you know, especially when things, when I got hurt or I was told you were seeing someone mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. things start happening in the room, then, then that wall goes up again. So Trust now I, I'm going to hurt you because you've already hurt me and I want out. Mm -hmm. right. And that's exactly what happened. And we'd had a daughter, Sandy. Um, she was a couple of, she was about three or four years old when this happened. And, um, uh, the first time when well, we got back together and remarried oh, wow. and it lasted about six months and we were both doing our thing. You know what I'm saying? It was, nobody was innocent in that. It's like a moment of weakness. Right. We were both guilty. Yeah. We both right. was, was wrong. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, cause I'm definitely not going to blame him for the, you know, for what I did. Right. Cause I take full responsibility for that today because it just is what it is. Right. You know? So, um, we had a daughter and everything went good and then we ended up getting a divorce well, something clicked inside of me when I got that divorce. Um, I was angry. Mm -hmm. I was really angry because I felt like he was the only man I'd really ever loved or the only man I'd opened up to mm -hmm. and told mm -hmm. my inner stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't function real well. And so I started using more. I started drinking every day, getting high, buying ounces of weed, staying, yes, taking Xanaxes, taking Somas, taking Lord's Habs, taking Demerol, taking Mepregans, anything. anything I can take that'll make me not hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I'm still not thinking that I'm, I'm an addict, but something's wrong, but I just can't pinpoint it. So um, we end up leaving. I go back home. I get an apartment. I can't function good. I end up losing a really good job. They laid me off, actually. And um, at this point, I've got my daughter. And um, I wasn't a very good mom, you know, because I took my daughter to every high I did to every party I was at, oh, to yeah. every drunk yeah. I did. Yeah. And I took my daughter, and one day, years later, she looked me in the face and said, hey, Mom, remember when we got drunk and you beat that tree up? I'm like, <laughs> we I mean, got I'm drunk. Laughing, but that's not funny, yeah. but that's funny. Like, yeah, yeah. Just, because just, she was so a part of everything vision. I did. Yeah. 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 God, so really. after that, um, I had a friend. Her name was Sharon. and uh, So... I told Sharon, I said, look, I'm going to go to the creek. I got arrested the night before. Um, I had five counts on me. Got out of jail, went home, showered. My mom come and got my daughter and said, you're not getting her back till you get yourself together. You're going to end up killing yourself or her. Okay. And I said, well, it don't even matter. You know? You, you didn't, yeah, at that point, done. my mom had my son. I had been busted in Snow Mountain, um, snowing in July with Harry Farrell and all of them. The plane had come in. I was fixing to make some runs. Oh, We'd get busted. That's why I went on to college and stuff. Well, anyway, um, at this point, you know, um, I'm going to make it. Mm -hmm. So I go on and um, head out to the creek, and we take my car. Uh, we, we started in Ronald's, but come back and got my car. Well, I told them I can't drive. I just got arrested the night before. And they said, that's okay, we're, we're going to drive, we'll go. Well, I was still high from the night before, and we're constantly using and drinking. They stopped and got wine and beer, but the only thing I drank is Jim Beam. And I drank it straight with the coat back, and that's just how I roll. And uh, so I went and got a pint of Jim Beam, and uh, took me three or four somas and two or three Xanaxes, and Ooh. went and got me an ounce of weed. We're going to the river. Well, we're heading and killing and uh, we'd stop and seen some friends, and I'm kind of blacking out because I'm so high. We got in a big fight at the state store, and um, uh, me and Rhonda had got in a fight, and I throwed her back in the back seat and dared anybody to say anything. Then me and Michael was fighting, so. And you're driving. Uh, no, well, no, Michael's driving okay. at the time. Okay. Um, so we go down the highway, <clears throat> and um, we never make it um, to the creek. We hit a car head on, um, and it killed the other two people in the vehicle. Jaws of Life cut me out. The um, motor came in the front seat. Um, I'm oh pinned in. Um, when I, I went into ICU unit, um, they had a, the ambulance driver, God bless her, and thank you if you ever hear this. She called my mother from the ambulance and told her, said, if you know a Phyllis Wilcut, please come to ECM Hospital. It's a matter of life and death. So my mom heard the, the thing, and she took off to the hospital. She pulled up the same time the ambulance did, and they were getting me out of the ambulance. Well, when I hit the ambulance, my lung collapsed, and I flatlined. Oh, so oh when God. she gets on top of me to shock me, the other one goes out. So they're cutting me, trying to put tubes in, but she's screaming and trying to shock me up. Off. They said, I'm coming up off the table. She shocks me. I come up off the table. They can't get her off the gurney. She won't get off. And my mom said that the that doctors were screaming, trying to get her off, and she kept saying, stay with me, stay with me. And um, so I was in surgery for about 14 hours. Um, I was in the ICU unit for, I think, a week or so. Um, when I came to, um, my legs were held with metal bars up in the ceiling. Um, my arms were out like this, and my head was back, and I was strapped down. I thought I was paralyzed when I woke up because nothing moved but my eyes. And um, wow. so the nurse came in, and I had a little thing on my finger, and she said, Miss Ritchie, if you can hear me, blink once for yes, twice for no. This is a morphine pump. We're going to put it on your finger. And she said, every time you get hurting or any kind of pain, just mash it. It goes off every 30 seconds. So um, then it went off every minute. Then it went up to every two minutes, then three, then five, and that's how they rolled with it. So when my mom came in a few days later, I passed back out, and a few days later my mom was in there when I woke up. And um, I asked her, she said, oh, my God, she's awake, she's awake. And, and 
I'm looking up at her and they're crying. And I'm thinking, wow, I must be dead. And I'm in the casket and they're all crying, oh you know, because I don't know I'm alive yet. And um, so I, they're all crying. So I finally, my mom said, she's awake. She's screaming. She said, can you hear me? And I said, yeah. But I got all these tubes running everywhere, so I can't talk to her. And um, so she says, uh, I asked her, what happened? And she said, um, you had a car wreck, a real bad car wreck. And I said, well, um, what did I hit? And she said, another vehicle. And I said, everybody's okay. And she said, no, they're both dead. So the only thing I could do was move my thumb, get me out of here, get me out of here, get me out of here. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. Yeah. So yeah. they moved me to a room about four days later. Um, I can't move. The nurses are moving me. I'm, I'm broke up. They got lung machines in here where my lungs have collapsed. The bar has been held up. My, my legs are in cast all the way up. It cut my foot off and my ear off. Um, broke this leg 10. This one's 6. Busted my arm. My elbow came straight out, but it didn't break my arm. It just broke my wrist. But it was metal all in my arm. It's still in there. But um, they sewed. You have your life. I was going to say this. They sewed the ear back on. And they sewed my foot back on, but my foot didn't take. They ended up setting up gangrene, so they had to amputate. Yeah. So you have pins in your, I mean, No, I have an amputated leg on the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fully, or is it just. No, it's it's four, it's six inches below the knee. Crazy. And you're lucky to have your life, and at the same time, you're, when you find out that you had, that. This has resulted in the loss of life. You are just hitting your right. morphine trying to get, get out. out because yeah. I didn't want to hear that because now something is definitely wrong with me. Yeah. yeah. So as I laid in that hospital for weeks, I realized you are a very sick individual. You don't know how to love. You don't know how to accept. You don't know how to live. Something is wrong with you. So um, when I got where I could move around a little bit, I called my friend Lorenda. She was in recovery. She had been clean for about three or four years. And I said, Lorenda, it's me. And she said, oh, my God, how are you? We were going to come to the hospital. And I said, "Um, I'm sick. Mm. I said, I need a meeting. And she said, hold on, we're on our way. She brought four people and herself and came to the room, and we had an NA meeting right there. That was my very first one. In the hospital? In the hospital. And that's, I mean, talking about rock bottom, though. Yeah. But I had no, I had, I mean, I was leaning on my back, spread out like Jesus on the cross. I had no way to look but up. Yeah. And me and him got a real good understanding. Wow. That's good. You know, because he said you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't pay attention when I was trying to talk to you. You wouldn't pay attention with the little signs I sent you, so... Right. Now that you're down here, maybe I can get through. Yeah. You know? It's like I'm going to get you to where you can just move your thumb yeah. and you and have to eyes. listen to me. Right. Yeah. Like, because what would have happened if you made it to the creek that night? You never know. You like, never know. That's, that's yeah. the thing. Right. It's like, God, it could right. have been even worse. So after that, I knew um, and when I got out and they took me to the um, courthouse, uh, my mom dressed me up. I looked like a canary. She dressed me up in the yellow. <laughs> Dress with the yellow shawl and a big bow in my hair. Alabama. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> Ma, Ma, thank you. Yeah. So, so I'm, and I didn't even care. I was so sick and so much. I didn't even care. So I looked at myself in the mirror. I said, Brandon, I look like a big sunflower or a canary bird. I don't know which. <laughs> he said, It's okay, Mom. Don't worry about it. Come on. Come on. So here we go. We get to the courthouse, and there is a new district attorney who is wanting to make a name for himself. Now, Don Singleman has just come in office. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers is mm. his motto. Mad, yeah. mad. Right. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, I was the first one sentenced under him. Wow. So you're, yeah. you have to go through all this excruci- excruciating pain, the bad news, the guilt, the, the emotions of right. everything, and then still face this sentence. Right. And, this, right. oh and it God. just gets worse from here at this point. Um, we go there. They um, call me in there. Um, I told my mother. I said, Mother, they're fixing to arrest me. That's what they do. They said, they're not going to just hear my story. They're going to arrest No, no, no. I said, Mom, I've been dealing with the police all my life. I'm telling you what's <laughs> yeah, fixing yeah. to happen. So be ready. <laughs> so I go in there, and he turns the little thing around. He reads me my Miranda rights. He charged me with two counts of first-degree murder, driving on the wrong side of the road, and a felony DUI. Now, that doesn't mm-hmm. include the five counts I had the night before. Okay. This about the night before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the, those five counts night before I fought the police. So this is another day, 
And so he calls me in there, and he reads me my Miranda rights. He said, Miss Richie, I want you to speak into the microphone right here. I want you to tell me exactly everything that happened on May the 14th, okay. 1998. He said, give me your name, social security number, and birth date. So I said, hi, my name is Phyllis Richie. Uh, gave my social security telephone number, you know, 205 21 yeah. Drives, most shows, Alabama. I need an attorney. <laughs> so... When I said that, he had a come apart. Mm. So he's taking me to jail now at this moment. Now I'm in a wheelchair, so he's got to push me. Yeah, so he's taking me to jail, and he's waiting around in the lobby. Mama said, what's he waiting on? I said, the press. Mm. Of course. He's a, new, he's a new district attorney, Mom. Now so she said, face. no, it's not going to happen. Well, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. When we opened the door, there was 1948, 31, and 15 news. Mm-hmm. And... They were, Miss Richie, how do you feel, Miss Richie? What happened, Miss Richie? Miss Richie, Rich, and I just said, I'm sorry that it all happened. Yeah. I plead the fifth. And you're already right. in because all this pain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, so I, I did. I pled the fifth because I don't want them bringing up all this other mm-hmm. sp- in jail for fighting, uh, Snow Mountain, um, the rest before. You know, I didn't want yeah. all of that to come out, and I didn't want my kids to suffer no more than they have to, so I plead the fifth. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just do what you do. Yeah. At this point, I was in so much pain. I didn't care. Yeah. Do what you do. You know, I've done done everything <laughs> right here to the worst. So right. whatever you do can't hurt me no more than I've already hurt myself. Dang. Do what you do. Oh, yeah. How about that feeling? So, right? That's powerful. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've stayed with my family for a, for a while, and then my um, they arrested me in the end of November. Um, um, we started going to trial. Um, as we go into, after the, they meet all the jurors and everything, the first day of trial, they lock me up. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been locked up ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, this is 1998. 1998, in, in December, they locked me up. Um, had my trial. They found me guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. Even though you weren't driving or... Well, well, that was the big the, thing. Uh, Michael and them said that uh, we were going down the highway, drove for five minutes, that I got over in the passenger side, and I drove for a couple of minutes and hit a car head on. Uh, now, knowing me as crazy as I was, I may have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I may have done that. You know, I'm not yeah. saying that I didn't. I'm just saying that I don't remember. Right. I don't You're remember. So the, all yeah. I remember is smoking it. We stopped at the store and got they got something to drink and beer, and I, I got a Mountain Dew. And I got a pack of cigarettes, and uh, when we pulled out of the gas station, I lit up the joint, I handed it to Ron in the back seat, put my sunglasses on, propped my feet up on the dash, <laughs> and that's the last thing I remember. Oh, so whoa. they said that I changed drivers, and I may have, I may have just had a moment and just said, move over, it's my car, I'm driving. Mm-hmm. So, at you know? the, but at the, um, as far as the, as the trial and stuff like that, they were saying you were the driver of the right. vehicle, so... Right. You were responsible. Right, and even though, it don't matter to me who was driving, it was my car and my idea. If it hadn't been for me, we wouldn't have been there to begin with. Right. You know what I'm saying? just technicalities. Exactly, exactly. And I'd hate to know that I pulled 20 years for something somebody else did. Right. So I take full responsibility for that. Full responsibility, that's good. Yeah, Yeah. I did that. Yeah. You know, not that I'm proud of it, just that I have to take, because it took me years to take to responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, always, I wanted to blame everybody else. I wanted to blame Max. I wanted to blame my family. I wanted to blame my dad. Everybody was at fault for what Phyllis did. That was my first reaction just now. Yeah. I was like, so you're in there for him? Like, yeah. I was yeah. looking for blame. But no, that just shows yeah. how much bigger but, and better you are. But yeah. that's just, see, I, when I got to prison, I honestly started working on myself. Now, the first couple of years, I went to SEG a lot. I had to clean every day because I couldn't follow their rules and stuff because I had my own and it just didn't, yeah. you know, me in prison wasn't yeah. getting along real well. Mm-hmm. So um, when I got my time sheet and it said 9999999, my EOS date, I packed my stuff and drug it to the front of the grill and said, hey, you're going to let me out here. I can't do this. Uh-uh, mm-hmm. I'm not staying. Yeah, they won't let you out. Yeah, so I snapped, and they ended up sitting, sitting me in mental health. <laughs> you know, because I'm, I'm about to have a breakdown here. Yeah. You know, it's fixing to happen. You actually saw the writing yeah. on the wall. And yeah, like, and when I seen it in writing, because at, at my sentencing, um, which was a month later after the trial, they um, sentenced me to two counts of first-degree murder, felony DUI, and driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, and they, my sentence was two lives. Yeah. I got a life for Mary and a life for Ruby. 
-hmm. you know, and it don't matter how much time I did, it will never replace the life of those two beautiful people. Right. But they are the reason I am who I am today. Yeah. Um, I was not going to let them go out like that. Yeah. And I'd hate to know that I spent 20 years and I'm the same individual that walked in, be the same individual that walks out, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no. But as I started working on me, um, I started seeing things that I had never seen before. I started, when I started getting clean, I started feeling emotions. Yeah. Um, I hadn't felt emotions in so long. It was new and I didn't really know what I was feeling or what was going on with me. I can relate I to this out. so much. Not yeah. not near as in depth, but just the, that one little, the emotion part, just to yeah. Yeah. me stop and do what I've been doing. It's like, I've cried the most in the past two weeks than I've ever cried in my life, it seems. Just because you feel. I'm now. emotional yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anyway, sorry. And it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's I mean, I it's understand crazy. because all this stuff's coming back and it's too much. <sighs> and it's, you know, it starts coming at you and then you're in overload mm -hmm. because you hadn't dealt with this for, for a long time. So you don't know how to do this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What do we do? We're addicts. We get high. Yeah. I don't like the way I feel. Hey, hand me that joint. Mm hmm. I don't, I don't like right, this. Give right. me some more of them Xanax out of that pill bottle. Whatever you can do. Whatever just, just I can do not, to not make, yeah. 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 make it right. make something Change feel it. happy in your life. And yeah. I learned as I'm, as I'm getting clean um, in the program, I learned that, um, you know, drugs is only a coping method. You know, something happened to us that's so deep that we have to pull it out and pull the layers back to start healing. You know, and that's what I did. Uh, I started opening up and sharing. I had a great, I have had two great mentors. I've had um, Angela who mentored me and helped me and stood by my side in Tuckwaller as I made that long journey. And Sherry, who was my counselor and who I work for in Birmingham Work Release, mm -hmm. who um, listened to everything I said, who counseled me, who helped me, who, who guided me. And um, as I started getting clean, I started caring about other people. You know, now it ain't just about me. It's about you. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I know how you it's feel. So crazy, yeah. You know, yeah. well, I you know how you feel. So you have said so while you're incarcerated. Now, now let me just recap, okay? Because just the it just blows my mind. You've gone through all these traumatic things in your life that led you <laughs> into using and to being yeah. the way that you are, and to um, to finding escape through drugs and alcohol and things like that. And you, and so then because of that, you, you, you found yourself in this addiction, but you didn't think you had a problem. Right. Then you, uh, you get in a, this car accident, which resulted in the loss of life. And then, uh, and, but then on top of that, you are, your body is, yeah. I mean, you went through this very traumatic um, you know, you lost your leg and you, and you um, had all these pipes in your lungs and all these things happen. Mm -hmm. Then to come out and find out that you're going for the rest of your life to prison. I mean, it's just yeah. like, it just blows my mind. It's just so, it's just such a traumatic mm -hmm. thing. And then you get there and you found yourself, you found people there out of all the places in your life. You found people there that were willing to help you and make you better and change mm -hmm. and try to help you change for the better and rid yourself of the of right. the, the root of the problem, right. which wasn't necessarily the um, it was it wasn't necessarily this this beer or this gym beam or whatever right. it was you drank or this joint. Right. It was that wasn't the problem. The problem was the was what caused you to feel like you needed those mm -hmm. things. Right. The problem was Phyllis. Mm -hmm. mm. That was the problem. Um, I was not a mental, mentally, emotionally, or physically, or spiritually fit. I was broken in all areas. Yeah. You know, I would wake up in the morning and say, don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to hear anything he had to say mm -hmm. because you didn't stop me from going to prison. You didn't Blind. stop them people mm -hmm. from dying. So I was angry at him, still finding blame mm -hmm. to blame somebody else. But as I started healing, working with Mr. She got me out of me and started letting me work with other addicts. Mm -hmm. And I would see me in you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I would see your pain. Mm -hmm. I could look in your eyes and I could see. Mm -hmm. I could feel it. Pretty you know, I, all right. That, all that, uh, yeah, I knew it. That, I could yeah. feel it all. And so that was what made my desire and my ambition so heavy and high to work with other women. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Um, I, I worked with them. Um, I 
would mentor, I would talk to them, um, share with them my own experiences, experience, you know, my experience, strength, and hope, and maybe hoping that it would change something in their lives as well, you know. Um, Turn the page for them. Huh? Exactly, exactly, because Without it really. Without having to go through all that. And right, to, you know. Right. Yeah. And then after 14 years clean, um, I, my second parole, they keep setting me off five years. After that second parole, I said, you know what? I did it y'all's way now. I don't care. I'm going to die in here. I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sitting out there playing space one day, and they said, hey, Phyllis, we'll be right back. We're going to go burn a few down here. I said, hey, wait on me. I'm coming with you. And this is after 14, 14 years. After 14 years clean. I walked up from that table, go sit down there on them benches, and I smoked three joints. Wow. Yeah. I was so high, I couldn't probably get back up the hill. <laughs> yeah. Then I sat at the wrong table when I got up there. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> so... This, and this, wow. is, this is in prison. In so prison. This is like, this is yeah. extra dangerous. I mean, right. This is like you're doing yeah. it in the back of the cop right. car. It's not like you're at, you Exactly. Know. So yeah. I'm, I'm buying now in prison. You know, now I'm keeping it on me. You know, we, we got a pocket, but us women at all times, and they got to do a <laughs> cavity search to be able to get it. So yeah. I ain't going to worry about that. Yeah, right. So yeah. now I'm, 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 I'm buying from other people, saving up my money, sending out and getting my own. And that's how it went. Well, it started to affect my, my health and, and my decisions. Mm -hmm. And one morning I woke up and I just turned on the radio and, and they were talking about, um, you know, uh, something to look up in the Bible. And I looked up in the Bible and I turned the page. And when I did, something that Miss told me, she, it said, excuses are tools for incompetence. It builds mountains of nothing. And people that use them seldom amount to anything. Mm -hmm. And that stuck in my mind. So I went to my classification. I told her, Miss, get me out of here. If you don't, I'm going to have a whole new charge up in here. Mm -hmm. Get me out of here. Can you say that one more time? The, the verse or the it's, um, excuses or? Tools for incompetence. They build mountains of nothing. And people that use them seldom amount to anything. Mountains of nothing that seldom amount to anything. That's that crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's my favorite. Yeah and, that's, wow. yeah, and she also told me my greatest revenge will be success. Yeah. That's my greatest revenge. So, you know, because for an addict, you know, revenge is our number one offender. Oh, yeah. We will sit up and build up a revenge that will end up causing us to use because we can't cope with the feelings that come with that. Right. You know, um, mm. we're, we're only one drink, one drug away from getting high. That's all. How you does know? that hit home, though? Like, uh, well, yeah. oh, well, you don't want me to watch you. You all get high, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh my god! And then yeah. just the, when you were talking about recapping earlier, I was just the the fact that you walked in this door is just a success story. About it in itself. right, that you're just, sitting here with us I, right I, now. I mean, didn't it even just like, blows my mind. and that's you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, it's like look at Phyllis. You didn't. I would have never in a million years <laughs> guessed what you've gone Been through. through. Yeah, just look. You're just a normal person. It's you know? crazy. I mean, it goes to show you. It's like the person sitting next to you. You never know what what exactly. they. What path they walk through. Right. You know what I mean? What they've been right. through. It, you know, that's the old saying, don't judge someone mm -hmm. because you've never walked a mile in their shoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, people, you know, I, and I've seen so much of it in prison, these women that are broken, you know, they, they live in domestic violence because they think they don't deserve anything better. Yeah. They use because they don't know how to cope with feelings and emotions that come up but from the shame and the guilt and the pain that comes from their past. Yeah. You know, I peeled those layers back and I worked on them. Finally, I got them all out. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from the guilt that I felt from killing these two people. Yeah. You know, I could, it took me almost 12, 13 years to forgive myself. Yeah. You know, because I had done the ultimate. I took someone's life. Wow. You know, who am I to sit here and, 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 and be sorry that I'm in prison? Right, right. You know, yeah. I'm breathing. I'm yeah. living. And they're not. You know, um, I, it was a lot of broken roads that I that I healed. My children, for one, they were six and twelve when I came to prison. They were thirty four and twenty seven when I got out. Oh, wow. um, they had children of their own. I have grandbabies, oh. so um, I'll be a lot better grandmother than I was a mother. Yeah. You know, because and they um, let you back in. And they're yeah. forgiving you and everything. Yeah, Woo, we and just met. I don't want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I just was yeah, talking about being emotional. The, uh, the time it's frame. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, children. That's something that that touches us so deep. We all have kids, and it touches us so deep because yes. you know we 
You know, we want to be good parents, you know. And like I told my kids, you know, um, I'm, I'm sorry for the part that I played in that. Yeah. You know, um, but I was sick. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know I was sick until I had to come to prison and work on myself. So I didn't consider prison a failure. I considered it saved my life. Yeah. Because you, you know, kept going. Right. And I'm a lot better person today than I was then. Because then I didn't care about you. I didn't care about what you said. You didn't mean shit to me. Right. And I would walk all over you, right. you know? Just to get high. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if it, you had something I wanted, I would use you and motiva- and, and mm-hmm. manipulate you into believing that you needed to do this. We kind of touched on that last podcast, or two podcasts ago, I guess, about how like when me and Brittany kind of got into the whole game or whatever, if you will, um, at first it was all hunky dory we yeah. were we were like oh look what i got look what i got right. in my room and then like once you get into it we were hiding from each other and locking our doors and like well he took too much last time yeah like, like you, know, you know it was you like stole from me yeah. i wouldn't even yeah. tell her it used to be like hey i got more let's go and then it was like i'm not saying a word because i want more i want it all you know? right and then, and, yeah, yeah and, and that's when we start crazy. getting when we know our addiction has gotten out of control mm-hmm. That we're no longer controlling what we use. What we use is controlling us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we become someone else that don't want to share, that lies about what we got. In the yeah, cheating on, on everything. Mm-hmm. If you send me to get some, I'm going to take some out. Just know that. So you might want to go get it yourself. Right. So, yeah. You know, because I got hey, I to be paid for what I do. Right, right. Because we felt like it's owed to mm-hmm. us. You know, righteous. It, yeah, and it, it's a yeah. Righteous person. You owe me. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> give me mine. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Yeah, and that's the crazy part of it. But you know, I worked all through prison to get to, to come where I am today. And you know, they said I'd never get out. Um, you know that I would die in there. And 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 I said I had gotten a really good relationship. You know, with that man upstairs. Yeah. And uh, I started believing what he told me. You know, I started. Flipping the tables around, trying to be a better person, trying to give back. Don't make everything about me anymore. Make it about somebody else. That's what I. That's what I tried to do, and um, and I'm still doing that today. Um, there is so much help when you get out from the OAA. They come to the prisons on Saturday for the females. It's the Offender Alumni Association, and it's run by um, Dean and Lisa. They come to the prison, and if the women are there, they need to go into that because when they come out, what they do is they help them get set up and get where they need to be in life. They're there for them. We have meetings once a week with OAA, and it's nothing but offenders, and I was sharing with you earlier about yeah. that. And it's it's awesome because ex-offenders coming out, they don't have anything. They don't have anyone. Not for 20 years. No, right. No and if you go to a halfway house, you are already got $500 tagged on your head for the first month. Yeah. Well, now that's overwhelming to me when I don't have a dime. Right. I literally don't have a dime. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that is overwhelming. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm like, oh, oh, you know. So you get kind of like, so they wonder why people return to prison. Well, they don't know what else to do because they've never been trained. Well, and you're never going to get a job. Right. Like a, well, a felon or whatever, you know. It's, it's like, hard. Yeah. 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 But well, Juanita yeah. Pitts and Melanie, um, they started a program called A Cut Above the Rest. And what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a six-week program. You get paid for a reset program to go. And um, if you're in a halfway house and just got out of prison, you can go for free. And what it does is it treats, it teaches you about construction work, mm-hmm. about the safety of the site, about mm-hmm. tools that's used, about the way you conduct yourself, about you know the harnesses and the clamps, and you know it teaches you every bit of that. Then on the mm-hmm. next to the last week of OAA. You go for um, equipment training, where you run the different types of equipment that they offer. And this is the program you went into. Yes. Because, I mean, yes. when you're 20 years, and I, and I was telling Phyllis, I said, do you know how to use that phone? <laughs> and she, <laughs> I, she I, was I'm telling sitting me. here like, this is all Chinese to be <laughs> in there for 20 years. Yeah, yeah and, she, and she said that she uh, went three days, and she was so mad. She was mad at hell at Verizon. was calling and saying... This phone doesn't work, and uh, and he said, "Ma'am, you gotta hit the send button." <laughs> <laughs> so even I'm like, number. "That send button, something serious." <laughs> I'm the number, and she said, "Yeah." Oh, but when yeah. I was at home, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, you didn't take your phone with you. You left it in the house, and when it rung, you answered it. When he didn't, you hung up. You yeah. didn't take it. So I had a hard time remembering to get my phone. Yeah. I'd leave it on the bed. Yeah, you know wherever it was at because. 
If you if you <laughs> call, I'm not home. I mean, but this is but this is something that you <laughs> like you know when when you come out of prison for that long, <laughs> and you had you were so yeah. blessed, and I think it was because. You spent your time after, after recovering and healing from yourself, helping other women recover and heal, and you like paid it forward. You know what I mean? And that's why I believe that you truly are blessed, and that you have you when you were did get out, you had already set yourself up to be successful by going into these programs and by mm-hmm. staying clean and doing your meetings and keeping that mindset. Whereas a lot of people, I think. Mm-hmm. Are like, woo, I'm free, I'm gonna go get high. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have kept with your sobriety, and that's just amazing. You know, that's thank you. Like, a like, true like, testament of success. Yeah. Like exactly. well, and I think it's also like if you want to really look at it, it's it's you know, God has the your plan for you, you know, yeah. and it, he's right. using Absolutely. you and he used you. He mm-hmm. he basically flat you to get you to understand and see to you know, do the work for that's crazy. The public and yeah. everything. It's right. just insane. Yeah. Right. Because so many of our teens are out there, and I believe that's where it starts. It starts in the household. Mm-hmm. Most of them is raised up by a single parent. You know, they, they run in the streets doing whatever they want to. And y'all know what's out in the streets. I mean, mm-hmm. we all do. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how we got, you know, it's how we all got where we were. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Doing yeah. crazy stuff yeah. like that. But, you know, um, they... Um, they come in and they're so young, but they're already addicted at 14 and 15 years old, you know? So your yeah. life's already a mess. You know what I'm saying? So I, it starts in the homes with these younger kids. You know what I'm saying? And they need to be put somewhere so they're aware of the drug, you know, what mm-hmm. goes on in the drug world, what really yeah. happens to those of us that end up going to prison, you know? And I, if you'd have told me I was going to go to prison, I told you you were crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. You never planned that. Yeah. No, but one second changed my whole life. Just one second and one choice. Whoa. Yeah. Game that changer. Is crazy. Yeah. Told you that was a crazy story, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to meet this lady and you're going to be like, wow, you know, it puts things in perspective, too. Because, like I said, when we started this, it's like hearing from other people and hearing other people's stories and how they were able to come out of that hole and they were able to. Um, to to heal and get better, mm-hmm. it it's inspiring. Isn't very, it? very you, much so. And then you go, well, well, my, you know, my little problems. It's like, well, she she can do it out of with, with everything that happened to her and come out on top and you know, and sure, be I sober can, and yeah. you know what I mean and help other people and do right and do good and just be a different, better mm-hmm. person. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's like. Well, what are you waiting on? It is so hard not to like compare um, right. different. Lo- like I'm sitting here going, "Well, shit!" Now my stories of addiction have, are just like nothing compared to this. <laughs> like I, I'm <laughs> contemplating, but at the end of the day, it's still I could have gotten there. You know, yeah, I right. could have gotten to where could you have. are and, and the story that you yeah. have, if not worse. You know, it's oh, like yeah. if I hadn't have right. stopped, you know, and, and yeah. realized and stepped back and right. the family right. and the kids and all oh my So gosh. they may have not have gotten there yet. Re- yeah. Yet. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I thought stuff like this happened to someone else. Yeah. But you. it doesn't. It happens to us addicts. You're one drug and one drink away from using. That's all we are. We, all we got is today. Yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and I live for that because... You know, somewhere out there, somebody's struggling. Somewhere out there, somebody just lost their life overdosing. Mm. Yeah. You know, somebody out there so, is needing help, and they're reaching out, but they don't know what to do. Yeah. You know? So, you We've know. We've had a lot of people in our audience and, you know, with family members or that have experienced this themselves and, um, you know, with the opioid crisis mm-hmm. and, you know, with just any drug, any alcohol. Right. And, um, and that's why, you know, We've just kind of been in, real inspired to do this uh, this podcast and to talk about these things and come out and be open and honest with it and like bring you on to talk about these things because if we help just in this podcast if somebody's out there right now listening right. to us and it helps one person then right. it was worth the hour of our time you know <laughs> right yes, exactly. exactly yes um, and I would help anybody if they just need to talk if they need to be removed from where they're at if you need to go in treatment. You know, um, I'm not hard to find. I'm all over Facebook. I'm downtown She's Birmingham. Facebook. You know, I'm on Facebook. She didn't know, she didn't know the difference between Facebook Messenger and regular text messages. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah. she found that out. Uh, 
She learned that one. Yeah, so I, I've learned a lot. Now I feel like I'm a pro on the phone, you know. <laughs> I, had, I can't hold it with both hands yet. I st- I'm still doing this. But I'm going to get there. Yeah, you know? you're going to get there. Yeah, I'm going to get there. Phyllis, you're just an amazing uh, woman. And I just, you know, I've heard your story before and I'm hearing it again today. And it's just like every time it just blows my mind. Um, that you can't, that you were able to pull yourself out of it and out of that, and I mean, just the, the you know, the things you've been through is just amazing. Um, that you've come out and you're on on this side of it, you know what I mean? Thank a lot you. of people wouldn't have kept, wouldn't have been able to see the light, yeah, you know, with yeah. all that darkness, and you were able to, and now you're using that for good to help other people, and I just applaud you, and I'm, I'm so proud of you. Yes, thank you, you're thank amazing. you. I, I literally don't know what else to say, but thank you. Like, literally, thank you. Like, yeah. just, oh, I mean, it's just crazy because I know that you just helped a lot of people in the comments that are listening yeah. to this or mm-hmm. that are driving right now. Or, and us, and too. All that. Yeah. yeah, and, and, and me. You know, like, it's just yeah. ooh, emotional. Woo, that was good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up right there. And yeah. um, uh, y'all stay tuned for the next few weeks. we got a couple more guests coming on. and um, Yeah. We're going to keep this going. Wow. Yeah, we got some more guests for y'all and the um and and leave in the comments, you know, if you just want to get it off your chest and just tell your story and just like we're an online meeting, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, we're that's like free. the four that walked into yeah. the to the hospital with her. Y'all walk yeah. into the podcast with us and yeah, let's, right? let's have this meeting. Right. Yeah, y'all feel free, please comment and um and show your love and subscribe and all that good stuff and um and thank you so much, Phyllis, for coming on. Thank you're you. welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You're so inspiring. Yeah. You are welcome. Amazing. You're so inspiring. Thank you all for tuning in this week for Don't Tell Mom. Hey. Two times Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. We're going to get it on YouTube and on the podcast. And y'all just keep listening. And, uh, and yeah, we'll see you next week. Y'all stay tuned for the next one. Thank you so much. Don't tell mom. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Peace. Bye. Don't tell mom. <laughs> 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 that was absolutely amazing. I just, woo! You can like, you can sit there and try to explain it to me, you know, but like, when it's coming out of the horse's mouth, not your horse, but like, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy. You know, it's like, oh, yes. Like, so how do I see it? Where do I go? Go to don't tell mom on YouTube.com. YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, yeah YouTube.com. Yeah. 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 Yeah.